On a hot summer night in 1988, Jane Borowski was stabbed 27 times by an unknown man. She was seven months pregnant. My name is Jane Borowski. I survived, and I remember everything. Jane is the lone survivor of a serial killer. I'm your host, Jennifer Amell, and this is Dark Valley. Join us in our search for America's unknown serial killer. Subscribe to Dark Valley, out now. Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. A 44-year-old cold case murder finally solved. Today, the Charles County Sheriff's Office announced an arrest in the death of Vicki Lynn Belk. She was only 28 years old when deputies say she was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and killed. News Force Darcy Spencer explains how officials were able to solve this case more than four decades after it happened. These are photos of Vicki Lynn Belk. She was 28 years old, a sister, a daughter, a mother. She was found shot to death in this wooded area in Charles County nearly 44 years ago. And today her family gathered with police to announce an arrest. Lamont Belk was seven years old when his mom was killed. Our community is a little bit safer today with this person behind bars. Police identified this man, Andre Taylor, as a suspect through DNA. He was 18 at the time of the murder. He's 62 years old now. He's being held at the county detention center without bond on murder and rape charges. This brings a sense of relief to her family, including her sister. Last time that I saw Vicki was at my wedding day. She was my maid of honor. Taylor's from D.C. and has ties to the Bryan's Road community where Belk's body was found in August of 1979. And authorities say he had been charged in connection with two murders in D.C. in the 1980s. We learned Taylor's DNA was in a national, in a national database because he was arrested for several violent crimes which occurred in Washington, D.C. Police say Belk did not know her killer. They say she was kidnapped when she went to her car, which was parked at RFK Stadium, sexually assaulted and killed. Her body was found here in this wooded area off Hello Metropolitan Church Road. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed? The Presser of the Week. I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcast, and Killer Podcast production. This week we are going back to 1979 and the murder of Vicki Lynn Belk. It was a gruesome homicide that went unsolved until this past July, 2023. In this episode, we will first go over the details of the case and then hand it over to the press conference where they announce a suspect has been connected to the crime. I'm reading from the press release from the Charles County Sheriff's Office in Maryland and Charles County, Maryland Sheriff Troy D. Berry announced that an arrest had been made in the death of Vicki Lynn Belk, who was found murdered 44 years ago in a wooded area on Metropolitan Church Road in Bryan's Road, Maryland. Quote, this case occurred more than four decades ago, and yet the detectives and forensics personnel never gave up. They continuously looked for ways to identify a suspect. This arrest serves as a reminder of our commitment to the doing of everything we can to solving crimes. We never give up. We never stop seeking justice for victims, said Sheriff Barry. The facts of the case are as follows. Vicki Lynn Belk was a federal employee who worked for the Department of Agriculture. On August 27, 1979, she left her job in Beltsville, Maryland, with her boyfriend, who was also her co-worker. He claimed he dropped her off at a bus stop near their office, but she has yet to reach her apartment in Suitland, Maryland. She was reported missing by her boyfriend the next day to the Prince George's County Police Department. He was the only witness to hear her last known whereabouts. A murder investigation was launched after a teenager found the body of Vicki Lynn Belk, and again, this was in a wooded area near Metropolitan Church Road and Route 227 on August 29, 1979. Belk had been missing since August 27th when she left work again with her boyfriend. Now, he reported that she never returned home that night and he was the last person to see her alive. 
On August 30th, detectives positively identified the woman as Vicki Lynn Belk. The Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Baltimore ruled the cause of death a gunshot wound. The case came to a standstill after the first phase of the investigation. In spite of the diligent work of investigators who gathered, stored, and examined various pieces of evidence, they sought assistance from other law enforcement agencies and forensic laboratories, but were still waiting for the leads they followed to yield results. The investigation into Belk's murder was not abandoned, even after many years passed, and some of the detectives retired. Detective Sergeant John Elliott from the CCSO's Criminal Investigations Division kept working on the case with different agencies, but none of the leads led to a breakthrough. The forensics team also did not give up on the case and kept testing the evidence with new technology as it became available. This showed the dedication and collaboration between the detectives and the forensic personnel who always look for new ways to solve cold cases. In early 2022, the CCSO's Forensic Science section re-evaluated the evidence in Vicki's case. Her clothing was submitted for testing using newer technology, and a profile was developed and entered into CODIS, which we all know is a national DNA database. A breakthrough in the Belk case came on November 1, 2022, when Noel German, the Deputy Director of Forensic Science Section at the CCSO, received a notification of a DNA match. The match was between the profiles generated from the evidence collected from the crime scene and a convicted offender named Andre Andre Taylor, who was 62 and living in Washington, D.C. Upon receiving the match, detectives began investigating Taylor's background and his ties to Bryan's Road, Maryland. Detectives learned Taylor's DNA was added to the national database after he was arrested for violent crimes that occurred in Washington, D.C. Further, Taylor's address on arrest records from the 1980s showed he lived at a residence in Bryan's Road, Maryland, an address that was less than four miles from where Vicki was found. Taylor's whereabouts were unknown since 2019, which made it hard for investigators to track him down. They collaborated with various law enforcement agencies, including the United States Homeland Security Investigations, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, Homicide, and the U.S. Secret Service Baltimore Field Office. These partners helped them obtain a search warrant for Taylor's DNA. After months of searching, they finally located Taylor in Washington, D.C. On June 16th, the Charles County State attorney's office presented the case to a Charles County grand jury, which indicted Taylor on charges of first-degree murder, first-degree rape, and second-degree rape. On June 22nd, Taylor, who was living in Washington, D.C., was arrested by detectives assigned to the CCSO's Criminal Investigations Division, CCSO's Warrant Fugitive Unit, the United States Marshals Service, Capital Area Regional Fugitive Task Force, and members of the Metropolitan Police Department. So this was a big takedown. He was taken to a detention facility in Washington, D.C. On June 27th, Taylor eventually waived his extradition and was transported to the Charles County Detention Center, where he was charged. Taylor is currently being held without bond. The original report and subsequent investigations did not find any connection between Vicki Belk who was 28 in 1979, and Andre Taylor, who was 18 at the time. Taylor was arrested in Washington, D.C. for crimes that were different from Belk's murder. There is no evidence that Taylor was involved in other cases either. Some of the agencies that did help the CCSO, and they wanted to acknowledge them in this press release, said that they worked with the Maryland State Police Forensic Sciences Division, BODE Technology, Sorensen's Forensics, Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C., United States Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Secret Service, U.S. Marshals, and the Charles County State's Attorney's Office. And the funding for the DNA was paid in part by the Department of Justice Edward, Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant Program. Now, they go on to say about Vicki. Vicki left behind her son, Lamont, who was only seven, and her five siblings, Judy, Lonnie Jr., Kay, April, and Granada, 
when she passed away. Now, her parents, Medell and Lonnie Sr., also died later. Vicki went to Minnie Howard Elementary School at T.C. Williams High School, graduating in 1969. She got a B.A. in education from St. Augustine College in 1974 and worked as a management analyst at the Department of Agriculture Culture in D.C. She belonged to the Oakland Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, after her murder, the Belk family initiated a scholarship to honor Vicki. The Vic- Vicki Belk Foundation was created to honor Vicki and provide scholarships in her memory. The role of the foundation is to assist in raising funds for graduating seniors at Oakland Baptist Church and provide opportunities that continue the legacy of Vicki Lynn Belk. Approximately 100 scholarships have been awarded to the graduates of OBC. Vicki's love and for education and the youth of OBC continues through this scholarship. Kay Belk, Vicki's sister, said, quote, Nearly 44 years ago, our family lost our sister, a beloved mother, a friend, to a tragic and heinous crime. The news of the grand jury returning an indictment for the individual responsible for Vicky's death and an arrest in her murder begins the long-awaited process of justice finally being served. We are grateful for the tireless efforts of the Charles County Sheriff's Office, detectives, and the forensic personnel who never ceased seeking justice on Vicki's behalf. And we extend our thanks to the Charles County State's Attorney's Office for their commitment and prosecution of Vicki's case. So this is another case where you get hope for Amy Mahalovic. I know that this is a trend in this particular series where I do like to bring up cases that have been solved, that have been cold or at least on the shelf for, you know, decades. And we all know that Amy's case is one of those cases. There is DNA being tested now, and hopefully there is some results. But if there's nothing to compare it to and nobody's in the system, DNA is only as good as that. So you kind of are left with this idea that DNA is going to be the cure-all for everything, but sometimes it just isn't there. But in this case, in Vicki Lynn Belk's case, this DNA was ripe for testing, and it actually showed up, showed up results, which is fabulous, and it's what you want to see because then these law enforcement agencies will continue to fund this type of testing. Because we do know that they have limited budgets. And, of course, cold cases aren't going to get the most attention because they just, they're, there's new stuff happening every day. You can't blame any police department for letting things not go, but just having to focus on what you can. Not everybody has an unlimited budget. And it's great that there are these grants out there that allow these things to happen. I know uh, James Renner and Nick Edwards from True Crime Garage, you know, they do the Porchlight Project, and that helps fund a bunch of these types of testing. So it's really interesting stuff, and this is a good press conference to uh, take in. And again, Vicky's case is just tragic. 1979, she gets killed by a random stranger, basically, who was 18, pretty young for a murderer but then again what do we see every day now so it is what it is and this is a case where I'm super psyched that they've got justice because it's not every day that that happens and we can at least take some solace in knowing that her family has some peace of mind and can start to put the pieces back together So let's jump into the press conference with the Charles County Sheriff. 62 of Washington, D.C., in connection with the homicide of Vicki Lynn Belk. Ms. Belk, who was found murdered 44 years ago in a wooded area on Metropolitan Church Road in Brines Road, Maryland, and at the time of Vicki's death, she was 28 years old. She was a daughter 
a sister, and a mother. Vicki was the victim of a terrible crime. And at the time of this incident, the suspect was unknown to law enforcement. For years, detectives, forensic personnel, followed up potential leads, kept up with DNA advancements, and worked feverishly <coughs> with crime labs and stayed on top of new technologies. The Charles County Sheriff's Office maintained a bridge of communication with the Belk family to remain committed, persistent, and dedicated while the Belk family remained steadfast and faithful. The Charles County Sheriff's Office and the Belk family were unwavering to their pursuit of justice. A few years ago, the Charles County Sheriff's Office received investigative leads in this case which ultimately directed our detectives, forensic investigators, to Andre Taylor. This was a collective effort from members of local, state, and federal law enforcement partners and forensic science labs in the closure of this investigation. Early this month, Vicki's family was notified of the break in the investigation, and they are here with us today to remind us of this. Vicki was loved and cherished. In a few minutes, we will hear from Vicki's family, but first, I would like to call upon Detective Sergeant John Elliott, our Criminal Investigative Division, and Deputy Director Noel Gurman of our Forensic Science Unit to provide a timeline of how this case unfolded. Detective Elliott. Thank you. Good morning. I'll give you a brief summary of the uh, investigation. Beginning on Tuesday, August 28, 1979, Vicki Lynn Belk was reported missing to the Prince George County, Maryland Police Department by her then boyfriend. The two had last seen each other the day before at the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C., where they both worked. Vicki never returned to her apartment in Suitland, Maryland. On Wednesday, August 29, 1979, a local teenager was riding his bike in the area of Metropolitan Church Road and Livingston Road. Uh, when he noticed a body on the ground in a wooded area about 20 feet off the roadway. The sheriff's office was contacted and officers from the Charles County Sheriff's Office responded and determined the case appeared to be a murder. On August 30th, same year, detectives positively identified the woman as Vicki Lynn Belk. Uh, the Office of Chief Medical Examiner of Baltimore ruled the cause of death as a gunshot wound. Now I introduce you to our Deputy Director of Forensic Science, Noel German. Good morning. During the initial investigation, detectives were proactive in recovering, processing, and maintaining evidence. Throughout the years, investigators worked with allied agencies and forensic labs pursuing leads. However, the case eventually went cold. As forensic technology advanced, the evidence in Vicki's case continued to be re-examined, a measure of commitment between our forensic personnel and detectives who continuously review cold cases to assess if evidence can be reevaluated using new technology. In early 2022, our forensic science section again reevaluated evidence in Vicki's case. Her clothing was submitted for testing using newer technology, and a profile was developed and entered into the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, which is a national DNA database. On November 1, 2022, I was notified of a DNA match between the profiles developed from the evidence obtained in Vicki's case to a convicted offender, Andre Taylor, age 62, of Washington, D.C. Upon receiving the notification of the match, we began investigating Taylor's background and his ties to Bryan's Road, Maryland. We learned Taylor's DNA was in the national, in the national database because he was arrested for several violent crimes which occurred in Washington, D.C. Further. Taylor's address on his arrest records from the 1980s showed he lived at a residence in Bryan's Road, Maryland, an address that was less than four miles from where Vicki was found. In other arrest records, he listed an address in Washington, D.C., which was not far from where we believe Vicki was abducted from. We work with our law enforcement partners at the United States of Homeland Security Investigations, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department Homicide Section, and the U.S. Secret Service Baltimore Field Office, who assisted us throughout the investigation and helped obtain a search warrant for Mr. Taylor's DNA. 
Based on the collaborative efforts and after months of trying to find him, Taylor was eventually located in Washington, D.C., and a search warrant for his DNA was obtained and served. The DNA, DNA was later confirmed to be a match between Taylor and the evidence from 1979. On June 16th, the Charles County State's Attorney's Office presented the facts of the case to a Charles County grand jury, which indicted Taylor on charges of first-degree murder, first-degree rape, and second-degree rape. On June 22nd, after Taylor was indicted, our Warrant Fugitive Unit, along with the United States Marshals Service Capital Area Regional Fugitive Task Force and members of the Metropolitan Police Department, arrested Taylor. He was taken to a detention center, or, I'm sorry, he was taken to a detention facility in Washington, D.C. On June 27th, Taylor waived his extradition and was transported to the Charles County Detention Center where he was charged. Taylor is currently being held without bond. In 1979, Vicki Belk was a 28 year old, I'm sorry, 1979, Vicki Belk was 28 years old, Andre Taylor was 18 years old. A review of the original report and investigative efforts since 1979 showed there was no information to indicate Andre Taylor and Vicki Belk were known to each other. Further, the crimes in which Taylor was arrested for in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s are not similar to the Belk murder. At this time, Taylor has not been linked to any other cases. Now we would like to give this opportunity to Vicki's family members to share remarks. First, I will call on Vicki's son, Lamont Belk, and after Lamont, Vicki's sister, Judy Belk, will share some remarks. Thank you, uh, Sheriff Barry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of speaking on behalf of our family and really coming forward with much and tremendous gratitude to Sheriff Barry and to the Honorable Tony Covington, the state's attorney for this county, for leading the investigation and now prosecution of this case. And thank God for touching their hearts and minds and all of those at whom they supervise for making this day possible. I also am tasked with introducing our family and their respective commitments and, and connections to this case and uh, to the investigation. So immediately to my right is uh, my mother's oldest sister, Judy Belk, uh, currently the CEO of California, of the California Wellness Foundation. She's traveled a great length to be here. To her right is my mother's brother, Lonnie Belk Jr., also known as Ricky, uh, who's a retired lieutenant with the Fairfax County, Virginia Fire Department. Immediately to my right is my mother's sister, April Belk, who presently lives in the area and, and works for Virginia Tech. To her right is my mother's sister, Kay Belk, who's a retired homicide detective and presently serves as an investigator for the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office. And to her right are my sons, first Joseph Belk, and being held by my wife Brooklyn Sawyers Belk uh, is my other son, Joshua Belk. They are the daughter-in-law and grandsons that my mother never knew. Further to my right is uh, my mother's nephew and Kay's Belk son, Donnell Daly Jr., also known as DJ, who's currently a, a police officer in, in Texas. And to his right is my Aunt Judy's lovely daughter, Casey Peaks. And to her right is her brother and my Aunt Judy's other son, Ryan Peaks. And there's so many other family and friends who could not be here for this moment. Uh, again, I just thank God for allowing us to be alive and well to bear witness to this momentous occasion. In 1979, I was seven years old. If I'm blessed to live to see another birthday, I will be 52 come <coughs> September. It's a long time. In 1979, as a, as a matter of perspective, Jimmy Carter was president in August of 79. There was no Starbucks. 
and Apple was just a fruit. <laughs> we didn't even have cell phones, believe it or not. I know that comes to the amazement of DJ and Casey and Ryan. There's a little bit of a generational difference. So, again, I started by thanking the fine leaders of this effort in this community, Sheriff Barry, the Honorable Tony Covington. Our community is a little bit safer today with this person behind bars. But special thanks are in order as well. Detective Sergeant John Elliott seized this cold case in 2007. I can't imagine what he was looking at at that time. And I'm sure he did not know it would culminate in this moment. But we thank you, Detective Sergeant Elliott. Yes, sir. Thank you to the head of the forensic unit, whom you just met, Ms. Noelle Gurman, and her fine staff, who employed modern techniques to well-preserved evidence to render this occasion. It would not have been possible without her unit's efforts. Thank you to John Stackhouse and his team who are prosecuting this case and for their reviewing the evidence and assessing it properly to present it before a grand jury. And thank you to the grand jury of Charles County that saw fit to return an indictment in this case. Thank you to Lieutenant Frank Tona who assisted Detective Sergeant Elliott Captain John Burroughs, Diane Richardson, and Debbie Harden, and all the fine staff and personnel of the Sheriff's Department and the State's Attorney's Office who have saw this case through and who have supported my family and I. Thank you to all of those who worked in the property room, the evidence room, the record room, who preserved this evidence. A lot of things can happen in 44 years. Without any evidence, we're not here today but they're nameless and faceless at this moment, but they have as much to contribute as anyone here because the evidence was there for this match to be made. And I thank you very much. I and I, my family thank you very much. It could have so easily been misplaced or mislabeled, but none was such the case. You didn't know my mother like we did. She was of no particular notoriety or fame, but you just did your jobs. Thank you. Thank you for the court and to the court for holding this person in custody based on the law and evidence. And finally, I leave you with this, the gratitude, the deep sense of gratitude, which really there are no adequate words in the English language to express. So we just simply say thank you repeatedly. But the gratitude is not conditioned upon or subject to or connected to any particular outcome in this case. We know that this is the beginning of a long and arduous process, and that's okay. Come what may, we are grateful. Thank you. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. Now let's hear from this week's sponsor. All right, we are back. Miss Judy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, my name is Judy Belk, and Vicki was my big sister. I um, want to start with gratitude, talk a little bit more about our family, about the community, and end with a brief call to action. Um, gratitude, uh, and Lamont said it all, for, um, for the excellence uh, in terms of the work that got us to this point. Uh, folks did their job and did it um, well. And 
I know that just doesn't happen, so we really thank you. Um, for caring and for providing us a little bit of closure. Family, the last time that I saw Vicki was at my wedding day. She was my maid of honor. We were in our family church, Oakland Baptist Church. Um, she'd helped me pull together uh, the wedding. Um, there are a couple of uh, folks that I just want to mention that aren't here, um, but I know uh, they're here in spirit. First of all, we um, were one of six. I'm one of six. Uh, we, uh, we also have our younger sister, Granada, who couldn't be with us. And then we always give honor to um, our elders. Uh, and the matriarch of our family is Joyce Casey Sanchez, who I knew, you know, if she wasn't ill, she would be here. And we hope that um, she'll make it to her 90th birthday uh, next month. And then, of course, our parents, um, Lonnie and Maydell Belk, I need to say their names. I was not a parent in 1979. Um, and now that I am, I can't imagine the process of bearing um, your child. So we want to give honor to them. Um, the loss of Vicki was just not to our family. It was a community. We are fifth, maybe sixth generation um, Virginians, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, Vicki and all of us were raised in a very close-knit African-American historical community in Alexandria called Seminary. Um, the center of that community was Oakland Baptist Church, uh, which was founded in the 1800s by our great-great-grandfather, John Wesley Casey. So when when we lost Vicki, the community also suffered. It was the church where Vicki and I were baptized, uh, where she, at the time of her death, was the assistant clerk. And the community was traumatized, um, so much so that after she died, you know, in the African-American community, folks either feed you or they give you money or resources. So. Almost immediately, the community start, um, the church started receiving $5, $10, and once we got through the, uh, the immediate grief, um, there was a small fund of money just coming in from donations. That was the beginning of um, <coughs> the Vicki Belk Scholarship Foundation, which today, um, has provided scholarships to over 100 young people and will continue. Um, because as horrific as Vicki's death was, we've chosen to focus on how she lived. Finally, um, I want to end by talking about a call to action. We um, we stand here as proxy to many American families who have lost loved ones to violence, to gun violence. Over 42,000 Americans die each year, dispor disproportionately communities of color. We, uh, we need more violence intervention strategies, trauma-informed care, and the national will for sensible gun laws to ensure that guns do not get in the hands of individuals like the man who is accused of murdering Vicki. This was also violence um, against women, and, and that continues to be an issue that we also need to deal with. And many of these cases go unreported and unsolved but not today, not in Charles County. So what can we do? We can continue to vote for individuals like Shelf, Shelf, 
uh, Sheriff Barry and State Attorney Tony Covington because um, we know it matters who um, leads our organizations at both the county, state, and federal levels. We need to vote for the right people and we need to hold them accountable. It matters who serves as sheriff, state attorney, governor, in Congress, and in the White House. And what else can we do? Because we can think, <laughs> given today's headlines, that violence, I mean, what can we do about it? We can all in our own lives, whether it's in our church communities, advocacy groups, be an advocate um, and stand up um, and support community-based organizations who are working hard, and there are many, and I've had the opportunity to work with supporting many of them in my role at the California Wellness Foundation um, and others across the country who are trying hard to ensure that our community stays safe. We do not want another family to go through what we've gone through. Thank you. You can see that the Belk family is well represented here and we thank them for sharing and also thank for their heartfelt remarks. I would like to acknowledge and thank the following law enforcement forensic partners for their dedication to this case. Their efforts individually and collectively contributed to the identification and arrest of the suspect. The United States Department of Homeland Security, Special Agent David Roberson is with us. The Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. The United States Secret Service, the United States Marshal Service, Capital Area Regional Fugitive Task Force, the Maryland State Police Forensic Science Division, Sorison Forensics, Bodhi Technolog Technology, Charles County, Crime Solver is Betty Turner, who is with us, the state's attorney here in Charles County, Tony Covington, and his fine investigative group, and our media partners who profiled this case over the years. Further, I would like to thank our dedicated forensic personnel and our criminal investigative division detectives who consistently review cases for more than 10 years the Charles County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Initiatives has worked diligently on the agency's cold cases. Through the support of federal grant funds, this initiative has allowed us to make significant progress in unsolved cases. We look forward to continuing our relationship with our federal partners. In closing, we are relentless in the pursuit of justice. We never stop, we never give up, and we will always search for ways to solve crimes. Today is a clear illustration of that. It is our duty and our mission to pursue justice for the victims of crime. And again, to our media partners, thank you for being here, and we now will take questions and answers. Can I, can I ask Mr. Bell a question? Absolutely. Uh, I understand that you are either a current or a former federal prosecutor, is that oh. right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, could, could you tell me a little bit about that and whether you're the lingering mystery of your, your mom's death had anything to do with your choice of profession? Uh, yes, I, as I look back, I believe it did. I don't think in the moment I was, a, I was conscious of it. But as I look back, uh, being a prosecutor, both in the state and federal systems, I, I, I'm able to attribute that to her loss and the experience associated with that. Are you currently a assistant? Yourself? No, I, I, I have since uh, uh, resigned. Uh, I'm now currently in-house counsel at the Tennessee Valley Authority. Oh, you were an assistant U.S. attorney in Georgia? I was, yes, sir. Which district? Is that the was? Southern District of Georgia, which, quite frankly, is a little bit gerrymandered. It's uh, more eastern, or uh, western Georgia, I should say. You were an assistant at USA. You were an ASA. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can Mr. I ask you, um, is there, I mean, you were seven years old, right? Yes, sir. Is there a memory of your mother that's given you strength all these years? Uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, I, in fact, I'll, I'll just share quickly. I think one of the uh, lasting memories was my being baptized and she and I going to our pastor and 
being counseled as to making sure I understood the significance of that. And uh, I think I answered all the questions correctly. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate it more as I've gotten older, what she did. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of mom she was, what you remember about her? I remember being disciplined. Um, <laughs> quite frankly, uh, um, and I, I don't know if that's just some compartmentalization on my part or what, but I would, I would think so. Uh, I remember being disciplined, but I also remember she was always working. In fact, when she, we last saw her, she was going to work that day, and we didn't see her again, but she worked at the Department of Agriculture, and she worked at the church, our local church, and she would often take me with her uh, as she was doing the church work especially, so. How much do you think that the grandkids have missed by not having her? Oh. Yeah, I, I couldn't even begin to describe. Uh, we, uh, my, my wife and I often say uh, we've lost our parents on both sides, and um, we, we, we feel the miss, feel the loss of our, our parents, and certainly they would feel the loss of their grandparents. Can I ask you a question? Do you and your sister have some part in the civil rights matters in Alexandria's children? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, um, you know, when when Vicky and I um, started school, I don't, you know, maybe I, I, I may hope I don't look as old as I am. Um, but um, Virginia, and at least Northern Virginia, was very different than it was when we started school. It was it was about you know, six or eight years, uh, nine years after the Brown decision. But uh, Virginia has always been quite stubborn about um, those issues and um, had still not um, integrated um, the schools in Alexandria. And so we were, when we started school, we were bus. Um, about three or four miles past a perfectly fine all-white school, um, Minnie Howard, to a separate but I would say very unequal um, all-black school, uh, Laos Crouch in, in Alexandria. And the bus would traditionally be late, we'd be out in the rain, and my mother, you know, who, you know, was really really just 22 at the time, um, I just remember one day overhearing her talk to someone say, okay, the belt girls are in. They were at, they, the, uh, I think the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and um, others who I know were in the, in the Jewish community were looking for a test case to test the Brown decision. And uh, my mother raised her hand and you would say, well, that was easy, but um, there were a lot of threats uh, for those who were who raised their hand, and my mother raised the hand, and as a result of that, um, a uh, lawsuit was filed against the uh, public schools in Alexandria, and Vicky was the lead plaintiff. They couldn't use um, race anymore, so they the Thomas. C. Chamberlain, who T.C. Williams uh, High School was named after, it, since his name has since been stripped off that, decided that what they would use uh, would be mental deficiency. So the court case said that um, this group of black, uh, of which we were a party, uh, should not be allowed because we were mentally deficient. We didn't have an IQ. Our attorneys. Um, chose to test that by testing the IQ of the white students. It appeared that we weren't so mentally deficient. And so um, we were allowed um, to, um, to go to um, Minnehaha, but it would be years before Alexandria Public Schools were fully integrated. If you know the movie, Remember the Titans, it wasn't really until we were in high school that uh, under threat of federal intervention, that Alexandria uh, chose to. So um, it was a scary time for us, um, you know, uh, in doing it. And a lot of credit goes to my mother, who was, you know, at 22, courageous enough to say she's going to make it happen. Can I ask you a couple quick questions? How, 
Can you tell is extraordinary and impressive and successful law enforcement, health, wellness, charitable work. Um, how has this tragedy and mystery okay. hovered over the family? Has it hovered okay. over the family? And yeah. Then, and then the second part, and I'd love to ask Lamont both right. of you as well. How now does this yeah. help? Well, first of all, let me just correct you. We are not a perfect family. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're not. We 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 have. Uh, our dysfunctions <laughs> like everyone else and that is the message that I want to give away we are very proud I'm very proud family but we have had our issues and there have been issues on we've seen all sides of the law enforcement effort so we're not perfect at all and I don't want to give that we are first of all we're a large family I mean as you know my son who now lives in um, you know, Alexandra, I said, say hi to everybody, every black person you see on the street because it's probably a relative. So <laughs> I, I would say that for me, I will tell you how it's impacted me. I view Vicki's death as a marker before, after. Um, and you have to realize I'd been married less than a month. Uh, I hadn't even opened up my wedding presents and I got, um, and I got the call. Um, and, and so, one, every year, I mean, my wedding anniversary is about to come up, you know, August 11th, 44 years, um, there's, there's always a, a cloud over that. The other issue for, for me um, is I didn't even know, I didn't have a name to it. I know now it's post-traumatic stress. <coughs> People who are in my orbit, know that um, I need to know if they arrived safely because Vicki went home, went to work one day and just didn't come home. And that, that happens all the time in gun violence especially. You don't get to say goodbye. Um, and then finally, on the positive side, it has made me more determined to be uh, an advocate and a spokesperson around violence prevention. And others yeah, might yeah, want to say. And then the second half of that was for both of you is then as well, how does this help this moment now? Well, I, I will just speak for myself. I mean, I, I just, I think it's very comforting to know that, um, that someone is going to potentially be held responsible for this. And that it wasn't someone that she knew or that we knew. That's another piece to this. Uh, and so, um, you know, your, the grief will always be there, but the, I think the healing is just a little bit more progressed now. And has this been a cloud over your, I mean, special astronomy, they've so. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I mean, it's, it, it was, uh, I only had her, I'm, like I said, I'll be 52 in a few months. Um, so that's really a fraction of my life was uh, was with her um, but I mean she, she created a great foundation for me in those few formative years but I I agree more with my my aunts and my uncles or my uncle who you know they and this was their sibling they grew up with her they have so many more memories mm -hmm. to have sh uh, to have shared with her and uh, um, um, so it's just a different perspective but a loss nonetheless yes. Sheriff Bell, can I ask you a question for yeah, um, if I'm recalling what I read before I came here, you were a first grader in 1960 when you were allowed to go to Minnie Howard finally, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and your sister, your older sister, entered that school the same year as you did, mm -hmm. 1960. What grade was she in? She was going into uh, third. Third grade. Mm -hmm. So she's three years older. She's she, no. no. How old are you? <laughs> okay. All right. it's, a, it's, it's a big age and it's unlisted, but no, uh, no. Um, I, 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 I know, um, you know, I, um, I'm 70 years old. Okay. And so you were first grader in 1960 and she was mm -hmm. third grade. Yeah. So mm -hmm. No, really, come on, 70. <laughs> <laughs> and I only, and only for Vicky would I tell my age. Now this is going to be blasted all over the media, right? Can you talk to us a little bit about your uh, fondest memory of Vicky, or just talk to us about what kind of... Uh, um, you know, we, as I said, we, we were a um, family of six, 
And so we were kind of raised in twos. So Vicky was my twosie. I mean, we were 18 months apart. And so we, you know, like my nephews, we were dressed alike when we were young. <laughs> um, you know, she was a big sister. She gave me cover. Uh, you know, she, um, you know, she didn't go as far away to college and then gave me the little space to go further away to college. She was the first uh, in our family uh, to go to college, so she inspired me. Um, and she covered for me from the very beginning. You know, I would, you know, be somewhere reading a book and she would cover for me and doing the chores. <laughs> um, and the big memory that I have is the day that we walked into Minnie Howard together. There was a, a concern that there might be violence. And, um, uh, and I remember the community group saying, just be prepared, just walk straight. Judy just hold on to Vicky's hand, and um, and I remember, you know, which tells a little bit more about my mom. And, and they said people might spit on you, they might call you the N word, um, and then I remember my mother said, "Hold it! Anybody spit on my girls, I'm gonna kick their ass." Uh, but uh, but none of that happened. <laughs> none of that happened. But it it was. Uh, I think we went to that school with with two others from the neighborhood, uh, the Bradbys, so it's four of us. It was very, um, you know. Did she hold your hand? She held my hand um, and, kind of, and checked in on me as she, um, as she always did. So, um, you know, she was, uh, you know, all I can say was my big sister, my partner. We grew up together. You have to realize, you know, when we, uh, because we were in an under, served uh, African-American community 10 miles from the White House, uh, first 10 years of our lives, we did not have access to running water, plumbing. So she uh, would take my hand and go to the outhouse with me. We would have to go and get pails of water to have water. And it had nothing to do with um, not being able to have access. So those, those services were available. They just stopped short of the African-American community that we're in. What, what college did you graduate from? St. Augustine College uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sheriff, can we ask you a, um, a technical question? I mean, we, we hear about Bodhi technology and the incredible stuff they do with familial genealogy and DNA and, and all that incredible technology. This was actually sounds like it was simpler than that. Did you simply put the DNA into CODIS and, and come up with a result? Can you tell us uh, how, what the breakthrough was? What I will do, I'll defer to uh, Director uh, no, uh, no, um, Noel in reference to her particular technology. That's her su uh, subject of expertise. Sure, so you are correct. It was simpler than that. We did not use genetic genealogy in this case. So it was just a um, regular profile that was entered into CODIS. A DNA profile. A DNA profile, yes. Does Mr. Taylor have two other murders in the District of Columbia? Uh, looking at his history and working on his background, he's, he's been charged with two unrelated murders. One, I believe, was 1980. The other was 1989. I don't know all the circumstances or facts of that. And then, you know, in, I say MPD, Metropolitan Police Department would have more information regarding those, but there are charges. Is there time for one of them? I'm sorry? Is there time for one of them? I believe so. Is he currently locked up? He is. I mean, on that, on old or new charge? The new charge for the indictment related to Vicki Bell. So he was already out on the old charge? That's correct. How long has he been out, do you know? That I can't, several years. Yes, so sir. Has he shared any thoughts, communications with your investigators of what this was all about, why, anything um, like that? A little bit. The day we arrested him with the Marshals Task Force, uh, transporting Washington, or MPD's homicide branch, and uh, I was able to speak to him for about two hours. Uh, we had a good dialogue, very respectful conversation with the two of us, but uh, for preservation of the prosecution phase at this point, I don't want to reveal exactly what he said uh, at this point, but it was, it was constructive dialogue, I'll say. Did he confess? Uh, he provided information. I'll just say it was, it was useful. Thank you guys so much again for tuning in to this week's episode of The Presser of the Week, sponsored by Who Killed? 
And again, I drop new episodes every Friday. This week I dropped a new episode on a Thursday, though. So I guess that's not always the rule these days. But hey, you know, it is what it is. But needless to say, I appreciate you all for tuning in. And again, this is a case that's very interesting. I like to highlight these cases because, again, the whole point of this podcast is to eventually one day find out who killed Amy Maholovic. And the more cases like this, the better. Because, as I said in the opening, the more funding it will become available. And that is very important for all of these cases because, again, funding is not limited or is not unlimited. It is very hard to get these things done. And again, they're cold cases. So you don't want to just blow all your budget working cases from decades ago, especially if you're a busy police department. Let's just hold out hope that the DNA testing that they're doing currently on the Amy Mahalovic stuff comes back with some sort of connection to a suspect because that would be the greatest day and i would love it for mark and jason and for the community of bay village to one day be able to celebrate the capture or the arrest of a suspect and can move on just like the belk family you know 44 years amy's 34 years There's a lot of pain that goes into that stuff. So just uh, remember that uh, if you know something, say something. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. Or you can follow me on Instagram at slow minus the W underscore burn media. Thanks so much again for listening. And as always, stay healthy and most of all, be safe. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're going to get. You're going to hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing 411, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship, and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast, not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. Let's go.